I'm Vahid Sandokhtar. And I'm Stefan Götzinger. We have put together a short film about nano-optics. The film is based on discussions with 16 scientists who have significantly contributed to the making of this young field. They were interviewed in September 2017 when we organized the symposium in celebration of 20 years of uh, nano-optics. It's hard to uh, say uh, what the beginning of anything was, but uh, I think it's fair to say that the seeds of nano-optics were gradually spread in uh, the 70s and 80s as scientists uh, gained more experimental uh, skills in dealing with both with uh, light and matter. <laughs> I had started with light scattering and nonlinear optics, and then I was uh, in in um, Yorktown on assignment for a year, and when I came back, then uh, I found the lab in excitation, excitement, uh, because of tunneling, and everybody had to do tunneling, and so I also did some tunneling at that time. I was always involved with a uh, uh, super resolution optical microscopy from my student time. But I happened to read the paper by Dieter Paul, and I was so impressed that uh, there is a method that makes uh, the resolution enhancement uh, beyond the diffraction limit. So I decided to study and join these uh, topics. I uh, got a lot of inspiration from the STM. This was, of course, common knowledge. It was uh, highly publicized at the time. It was uh, uh, shortly after the discovery, uh, Nobel Prize on this. And obviously, when you finally can see atoms uh, with a tip, with a sort of super uh, record player, um, you think, why not use light, which, as we know, uh, is also a way to record information. 
And uh, so came immediately the idea, could we do that, see single atoms or single molecules by light? And actually it was done before in the gas phase with single atoms um, in uh, atomic beams. And at about the same time with, um, with uh, trapped ions. And so the next step was, yeah, can we do that in condensed matter? I had a background in molecular physics with molecular beams. And then when you work with molecular beams, you think you work with single molecules because all the molecules interact individually with each other. So you interpret everything as if you have single molecules, although each molecule ends up in the pump. Doing scanning probe microscopy on a table at room temperature, your dream is, can I actually see these molecules and keep them there and go back to the molecule and look at them? So doing STM, atomic resolution, you're there, but it was vacuum and only semiconductor stuff or metallic stuff would work. Going to atomic force microscopy, we already managed to get, again, atomic resolution, but only topography, ne never, never spectroscopy, never looking at an active real molecule. So one of my dreams was to see indeed these molecules on the surface in some spectroscopic contrast. In 1989, I read this article by uh, Arosh and Klepner on cavity uh, quantum electrodynamics, which was for me a mind-blowing article. I still think it's a mind-blowing article. At that time I was working on light scattering, mostly scattering by gratings and that involved plasmonics. Plasmonic was already a very trendy topic in the 80s. That was well before it became plasmonics. It was about surface plasmon excitation. The word plasmonics didn't exist, but uh, this excitation was uh, changing a lot the properties of uh, reflection by structured surfaces, rough surfaces. Well, in 1980, I was actually working on uh, solar cells, and I continue to work on solar cells to the present day. I was a PhD student at the University of Heidelberg in the Physical Chemistry Institute with Professor Wolfrum. And I was working on nucleobase specific quenching and for DNA sequencing. I was part of a confocal community, not so much of a near field community or, or single molecule community which was evolving around that time. The first paper by her the British group about the quantum polarism came out in 1985 and that gave her a strong impact on the young scientist at NTT and uh, maybe around 1986 uh, we sort of uh, started to search appropriate experimental technique to implement this concept of quantum polarism and eventually uh, quantum computers. The topic of my PhD work was the growth by molecular beam optexy and optical study of short period superlattices. So novel kind of uh, uh, semiconductor uh, macrostructures which were taking benefit of strain, the deformation of the crystal, to uh, engineer their electronic properties. And during, the, the, during this PhD, I also started to work on uh, quantum dots. Uh, so my PhD work was uh, on um, quantum coherence and interference effects in atomic systems and the applications in quantum optics. So this was in a group of Marlon Scully at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Very interesting place. I came to Caltech. Uh, as a PhD student interested in solid state physics and uh, semiconductor physics. Around year 2000, I was uh, mostly working on photonic crystals. So uh, that was probably at the peak of the photonic crystal research. So uh, I was doing a lot of uh, theoretical calculation of photonic crystal and trying to figure out uh, how to use these kind of structures for what kind of applications. At uh, this time, I was working on uh, um, multiphoton excitations in atoms and uh, multiphoton ionization, looking for distributions of photoelectrons. The 90s were a decade of nanoscience and nanotechnology. People from uh, all kinds of fields were dreaming of building nanomachines and manipulating and looking at uh, materials atom by atom. 
at that time, uh, scanning probe technology and single molecule detection were uh, already existing. And uh, so many were dreaming and hoping to uh, combine the nanometer spatial resolution with uh, uh, either very high spectral or high temporal resolution in spectroscopy. And the idea was to really try to see how uh, atoms interacted with their immediate environments. Unfortunately, the laboratory skills were not fully developed and some experiments were kind of speculative and comparison between theory and experiment fell short at some times. That's right, and uh, some people also started reinventing things that were already known uh, in the past. Uh, so towards the end of the 90s, uh, some of the people working on very different things like photonic crystals and uh, semiconductor quantum dots and uh, uh, near-field microscopy and plasmonics, they all uh, started to have an exchange in talking to each other, finding a common uh, kind of denominator. Uh, but at the same time, some people found some of the things they were doing kind of difficult and started to leave the field. In the early 90s, really, the understanding of the mechanism of uh, how an image with sub-resolution was produced, uh, that, 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 was, that was really an issue. So 95 to 2000 was quite a boom of near-field optics. And I think uh, many people realized during this time also that a lot of hopes, okay, or promises that were made, okay, are difficult to achieve considering, you know, that the fabrication technology and so on was, was not there for these ideas. And I think uh, a lot of also, unfortunately, mediocre work was produced. And I think uh, a lot of people during this time also started to look into other directions. This morning at this conference we had the story of near-field optics and that's obviously one of the big hopes of the 1990s that uh, has failed so far at least to, uh, to, to bring its promise. Uh, the technique has been exceedingly complicated uh, to operate and, uh, and slow to operate and um, um, it has been overtaken by the far-field uh, microscopy techniques as, as we know them. Around uh, 2000 the uh, antenna ideas were not yet, uh, well, just came up, I would say. Before, uh, I had the feeling that uh, microscopy idea alone wouldn't do it. Antennas rather disappeared from physics immediately after World War II. And so you could read uh, excellent uh, electrodynamics books, electromagnetics books in physics, wonderful books like Jackson, uh, which were uh, important historical books that trained two generations of physicists, and yet you don't learn anything about antennas, really. And so it became forgotten. So now we have an opportunity to bring antennas back into optics. Most uh, important contribution came from, uh, from uh, atomic physics and quantum optics. It is clear that when we uh, play with uh, cavity, QD effect, cavity QD effects on quantum dots, when we uh, generate quantum states of light uh, using a, a single dot, we are uh, clearly uh, following the path of Serge Laroche in the first case, and people like uh, Alain Aspe uh, for the generation of uh, uh, single photons or entangled photon pairs using radiative cascades. The work on single molecules uh, has been also uh, inspiring for us at the first stage of the development of uh, single dot spectroscopy. 1995, um, in that area, you know, uh, the interest in, at least in, in lasers and semiconductor laser physics had moved to more quantum optics uh, application, so cavity, you know, solid state cavity QED. From what was written in the article, I understood that you had to make little cavities about, preferably in, like in metal, and I thought if I had a cylinder and I put molecules inside, I could actually get a sort of 2D cavity uh, in two directions, in X, Y uh, direction, and I could probe the molecules inside the cavities by sending some UV light out, looking at fluorescence on the other side. That was the basic idea. Thinking of the word spontaneous emission, Many people 
would have thought that maybe you kind of reverse this because spontaneous emission has this stochastic uh, um, connotation and um, stochastic uh, statistical events you cannot reverse. Um, but when we thought about it, it became clear that this is just uh, um, quantum mechanical unitary evolution and that should it should be possible to go backwards. And of course, if you go backwards, all the light energy of a single photon goes into the atom. And eventually it comes to a point much, much, or to a volume much, much closer than the, uh, much, much smaller than the wavelengths cubed. One of the things that uh, I realized about solar cells is that their performance was completely controlled by spontaneous emission. Actually, it wasn't me who first realized that, it was uh, Shockley himself. And uh, in his paper on solar cell efficiency on the fundamental limits, uh, it was always uh, balanced against uh, emission of light back to the sky. When I was a graduate student, when I was going to uh, optics, quantum optics and photonics conferences, I realized at the time that you know there is a kind of a community being developed, which is you know really kind of looking how to. Uh, kind of explore the possibilities of really isolating individual uh, particles, individual uh, molecules. And um, it became clear with me over time that, you know, basically, you know, borrowing, you know, some ideas from this uh, community and also supplementing it with kind of, uh, let's say, the ideas for coherent control, uh, which originate from the field of quantum optics, uh, is a very promising new direction. I guess uh, people were really fascinated by uh, internet, optical communications, mm -hmm. uh, and information processing. So uh, there were a lot of discussions about trying to use photonic crystal structures for information processing and even dreaming about maybe computing based on uh, photonic crystals. I think this was during this time that other facets okay, of nanoscale optics came into the field and so out of near field optics became nano optics, okay, which is a much richer uh, field uh, today. Many different communities merge. So before 2000 we had photonic crystal community, we had semiconductor communities, quantum dots communities, both uh, colloidal quantum dots, mostly chemistry and uh, people from semiconductor physics doing epitaxially grown semiconductor. Um, and also, of course, uh, my initial community, which is near-field microscopy. So all those communities merge, uh, and that became nano-optics. If you want to do optics at the advanced level, you need the combination of optics and quantum optics, or nano-optics and quantum optics. When I came to Constance in 1999, I heard for the first time the word um, nano-optics. Um, I was about to start my PhD. It wasn't clear to me exactly what it means, but I was convinced that I wanted to work in that field. And um, there were kind of many facets like cryogenic laser spectroscopy, nanoparticle spectroscopy, um, whispering Gallimard resonators coupled to single emitters. And I, I didn't really understand how this fits together, but it sounded very appealing to me at that time. Yeah, so that was actually the spirit of nano-optics. Uh, when I uh, started my group uh, at the chair of Jürgen Linek uh, at the University of Constance in 1996, uh, the idea or the dream was to realize uh, some of the uh, quantum optics type of uh, scenarios that people were thinking of uh, involving single atoms uh, in traps, for example, uh, in the solid state. And we were thinking of using uh, single dye molecules as uh, sensors for uh, the quantum environment for sensing surfaces. And uh, there were also a good deal of uh, uh, questions regarding the basics of near field microscopy in the area that we wanted to uh, address. I remember that we had even difficulties placing our um, research projects, topics at conferences in the right sessions because they were either semiconductor people talking about micro cavities or um, single molecule people, molecule people talking about SNOM type of work. That's right. Uh, so there was clearly a need for, for, for a concept, for an umbrella concept. 
Um, now, I heard the word nano-optics the first time in 1996 when uh, Franz Ausenheck from Graz uh, in Austria came uh, to visit us for a seminar. And uh, he threw in this name, and later that year, uh, Jürgen Linek and I thought that uh, this would be a good name for, uh, for our new group uh, because it summarizes everything that you want to do. You want to study light and matter at the nanometer scale, whether it's classical or quantum optical. Uh, this word uh, would have everything. So from then on, our group was called Nano Optics. Nano optics has many meanings. You have optical structures that are nano, uh, and today you have metallic structures that really are nano. Um, but you also had quantum wells. It was a period, it was about 10 years after quantum wells first emerged, and they had interesting optical properties. Nano optics was on the map, okay, in different areas like the uh, solid state physics, people looking at, uh, you know, quantum dots and so on. They, they, they used this term and uh, I know that uh, in Constance, okay, you guys used also the term nano-optics. But I think in general it was the desire, okay, to be a little bit broader um, than, uh, than the near field. And I think it's a very fair definition that you're using optics to address the nanometer scale. Whether it's the nanometer scale of the optical field or the nanometer scale of the material system, it doesn't matter. 20 years ago, I knew, I know that you like this uh, term nano-optics and to me it was a, an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. Because for me, optics, I was seeing optics, as we heard again this afternoon, I was seeing optics as a spatial concept. Optics is everything that happens to radiation at scales larger than the wavelengths. So in this sense, nano-optics cannot exist, right? But of course you can see optics in the frequency regions. If you think of optical photons as photons with a frequency of 10 to the 15 hertz, thereabouts. Then of course we can do of course all kinds of interactions at all distances and then nano-optics of course takes its full meaning. So I think nano-optics is really the field of interaction of light at optical visible frequencies or UV visible frequencies and near infrared frequencies with matter at all scales. So in this sense of course nano-optics. What really I think is interesting to me uh, about nano-optics is the ability that you can shape light. You can use subway plan structure to shape light. So as time passed, many bridges were built among, between different fields and nano-optics became basically an umbrella concept. Yeah, and by 2000 we were uh, organizing uh, conferences uh, with that title. Um, when I look back, I think the progress in the field has been really quite remarkable. Back then, uh, quantum optics and optical microscopy were completely different fields. And nowadays people talk very easily about quantum gas microscopes and coupling atoms to photonic nanostructures. Mm. It's, it's more like common sense nowadays. We also ask some of the pioneers about disappointments, challenges and potentials. I think we... Um, we have a tendency these days to forget about these very basic questions. Uh, some of them have been solved, many of them are still open, and it's a bit of a disappointment indeed for me that so many groups uh, go to applications, as I see biophysics as a sort of application, without stopping uh, a little bit to think a little bit about the basis of um, light matter interaction with complex systems and which indeed is a preparation of the next uh, wave of experimental advances. What has been uh, disappointing me from time to time is um, an excess of hype uh, around uh, expectations. It has been the case at some point for the, for the quantum dot laser. It is the case maybe now, now also for, for um, integrated quantum photonics. I, I, I don't think we should promise to build uh, some large uh, quantum uh, computing system. What we can do actually, we can actually uh, develop, introduce novel devices displaying novel functionalities. We will be able to build novel optoelectronic devices working at the single photon level. Emitters, detectors, uh, nonlinear optical gates. 
Well, nano-optics got mature, but it's still not there. So, so one of the fundamentals we still have is still fabrication. So we can make plasmonic structures or uh, antennas or knee field probes, but the control of that is, is still limited. And every year we see we're getting little but better on that. So we're now having a control on the 20 or 10 nanometer scale. But the, actually the real interaction, stronger interactions happen on the few nanometer scale. Technologically we can just, yes, just not control this. And we know that if you want to have stronger interaction, this is actually the distance where these things happen. And you see people still kind of doing very indirect, desperate experiments to try to get something working at that scale. This interplay between quantum optics and you know nanophotonics really opens completely new frontiers. And I think we are now only at the beginning of, we are just tipped, you know, the iceberg. The key challenge from my point of view is really um, uh, kind of uh, extending uh, the techniques for um, kind of confi light confinement and interactions uh, with atoms to kind of fully coherent and fully reproducible domain. Create a material from scratch, you know, atom by atom almost, um, that is tailored uh, to provide the coherence properties you need, uh, to provide the polarizability, the um, that you would require and then somehow integrate it with, you know, tether that, you know, make that structure and tether it in a way that you don't lose all these properties by interacting with the environment, um, but yet still be able to connect it to a large, you know, uh, um, slightly larger optical structures. So starting at the nanoscale and moving up to more micro scale and eventually to, you know, even optical networks. Um, but I think that that is not so far from where we might be going. And I would say in the next 10 years, uh, 15 years, that this is something that we could accomplish if we really worked on it. I think it's very likely one could imagine developing um, you know, new forms of quantum matter that involve not just solid massive matter, but also photons. And where you have some you know, binding at the quantum level of, of uh, radiative photons, and, you know, or you know, radiative photons play the role of some glue to matter and you're able to generate some very exotic, uh, you know, very interesting um, quantum many-body systems that involve both photons and matter. Definitely in, in, in terms of quantum metamaterials, we st there are many challenging issues and this is definitely still a research topic. What are the coherence? How do we control the losses, the quenching? Of course you can write a master equation and try to solve it and take a system which is bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the key issue is to come up with a simple picture of what's going on, identify the right concept, and be able at the end of the day to say uh, how you could design a system and why it would be coherent or not. And I, I mean quantum coherent. Uh, what is decoherence? Can, how can you control decoherence? And what you should do to control decoherence? Devices uh, such as uh, single photon sources or uh, sources of entangled photon pairs will, be, uh, will become uh, interesting in the future. Uh, not necessarily in the context of uh, very complex systems, but for instance, for, for, for quantum communications, we know that we, we need at some point to develop quantum repeaters. And for that, we need quantum memories and we need very efficient uh, sources of entangled photons. Eventually, the particular technique actually uh, will be successful in the real world depends on many factors. The uh, performance, uh, cost, size, the uh, maintenance, uh, easiness. There are many factors actually are, uh, we have to overcome to uh, compete and eventually win over the existing techniques. That sort of our view should be, uh, I think, are, are shared by uh, sort of every sort of our scientist uh, in all level, I think, are working in this uh, quantum technology. I think if they sort of are use the word quantum as an excuse, uh, it will never flower in their world.
the general property of thinking about using light to control energy flow uh, and uh, to impact, for example, uh, a wide range of energy conversion technology. I think that actually would be quite interesting uh, area to think about in the future. And the most fundamental level, uh, most of our energy come from the sun, which is light. And so uh, the ability to think about light as a thermodynamic object, I think, uh, will play a very significant role uh, in thinking about the, uh, many of these technology. Uh, the grand challenges in biophotonics, I think, uh, especially the, the super resolution imaging, the progress in single molecule based technique, that means increase in speed, faster and more um, complex environment. And this is at the moment still not possible. And this, I hope that all novel um, technology will help us, or let's say, um, have been improvement of the detection schemes because photons are so so rare. I mean, ideally, um, one would have to get away from fluorescence at some point and get a contrast mechanism working well for for non-labeled um, features, materials, whatever, biological samples. That's a very tough problem to solve, um, and I think this has to be sorted out by a physicist again. I think there is much to be gained if one com comes up with alternative contrast modality, even if it has a limited use, a range of, uh, of, of usage. It's quite impressive. I mean, we see this in this meeting. Uh, it covers a vast, uh, vastly different areas. It goes from biology to chemistry to physics, quantum physics. So despite uh, all the ups and downs and uh, many difficulties and challenges, uh, I think nano-optics has come a long way. Indeed, people nowadays show single molecule detection or single photon generation in lab courses at universities. And if you think about nanotechnology, every university nowadays has access to um, sophisticated nanofabrication technologies. Yeah, and other commercial instrumentation. Uh, for example, we used to make our own piezo slipstick drivers for cryogenic applications and nowadays you can just buy them and uh, admittedly they work a lot better. You can buy even complete microscope kits to do high-end microscopy by yourself and um, also detector technology has come a long way. You have very sensitive single photon counters and very sophisticated cameras these days available. So as we just heard, an important challenge will be uh, to realize more complex states of light and matter where non-trivial quantum mechanical effects can be realized. Yes, for example, like coupling many atoms or molecules over large distances via a photonic channel and controlling each and every atom one by one. There are also lots of other challenges, for example, uh, in imaging and especially bioimaging. Uh, you want to uh, do label-free uh, imaging and also uh, deep tissue imaging, imaging through scattering media. The ultimate goal of nano-optics is to understand and master the interaction of light and matter. Um, and uh, what you really want to do is realize all those wonderful Gedanken experiments that you simply jot down on a piece of paper, drawing an atom, drawing a photon, and they're supposed to interact. Or you want to understand the conditions under which you can really see individual atoms move or interact with their neighbors, all optically. Mm -hmm.